Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Joey Lefstrand. I'm a, a postdoctoral research fellow at SOAS, University of London. And in today's uh, webinar for the linguistics department, we will be uh, discussing a film called What If Babel Was Just a Myth? We have with us today three of the creators of the film. The film centers around Florian's uh, work in language documentation of a language called Lal, spoken in a village called Gori in southern Chad. Um, and it also treats uh, uh, topics like language endangerment and multilingualism as well. Uh, so the three uh, participants with us in our panel today who uh, worked on creating this film include Sandrine Lonk, who is an African ethnomusicologist and associate professor in the Department of Music at the University of Paris. Florian Lyonnais, who is assistant professor of linguistics at Princeton University and Wermaji Honati, who is scientific director of the Centre de Recherche en Anthropologie et Sciences Humaines, or CRASH, in, in Jumena. So thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, I will say just a word about, uh, since our topic is uh, also about multilingualism, the panelists who are multilingual might choose to express themselves in other languages as well. So uh, if we do get some discussion in uh, French with our Francophone panelists, we'll try to maybe do some translation by committee or summary for those who may not uh, speak French. But of course, feel free to uh, use other languages to uh, express yourselves as well in this discussion. Um, to get us started, I'll have a few questions that I've uh, prepared to get the conversation going. But of course, other participants will be free to ask their questions as we move along with this discussion as well. So let me start with a question for Ramaji. Um, not, maybe not everyone is following the news in Chad, but in the last uh, month or so, it's been quite a dramatic turn of events as um, the president uh, unexpectedly lost his life. Um, and uh, there's been a uh, military uh, committee taking over and there's been a transition government. So it's been quite a, um, let's say an unexpected and uh, somewhat destabilizing time in Chad right now. Uh, since Remaji, we know you're there now in Njimena, maybe I wonder if you could just say a few words about what the situation is like in Njimena now, uh, how, how these turns of events have sort of affected the way people are living their lives. And maybe if you have any sense of how it's affecting people outside of the capital city in areas like uh, the village of Gori, do these kind of events affect the lives of people in that Chad or what's the situation in Chad like now? Okay. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Joey. Um, and uh, thank you to all the participants. Uh, I think, yeah, as um, everybody might have been uh, following on the news uh, since um, some weeks, actually, we are living uh, a situation that is quite unstable, being at the same time not something very new for this country, uh, because uh, those kind of situations with coup d'etat, uh, the rebellions attack uh, toward the desert heading to Jamena is nothing very new. Uh, and before getting to the actual situation, you know, I would like to establish a link with uh, this research and the situation you know, with those rebellions. Uh, one time with uh, Florian on the field, while uh, and this time um, our colleague uh, Sandrine couldn't join us, we have been obliged to leave the, the field and to get back to the city uh, because the zone we were doing this very research uh, were a zone that uh, was uh, also occupied by a rebellion that at that time was not really very visible, but there were a tough action of the state on those rebels. Uh, kind to expel them from that zone. And we have been obliged, uh, as we could say in French, collateral they got to leave the space. And so uh, as a researcher uh, living in a country like Chad, I mean, we always get to establish a link with the situation and our work actually. Uh, so the situation here since um, some weeks is that we got a, what is clearly a military coup d'etat the son of the, the, the late president taking over the power uh, and instituting a military uh, transitional council, uh, suspending the constitution and all the institutions. So it's clearly a, a coup d'etat. But when this happened, there was two approach to that situation here in Jemena. Uh, the first is about uh, the majority of the population uh, in the country and mostly the youth that I've seen what was happening as an opportunity uh, for a real change in terms of 
uh, new governance to come into country, new people to govern the country, and uh, new people that could open really or could let the democracy happen in this country as this has been promised since 30 years. And this is one side. And on the other side, we got um, the close circle of the late president, mainly uh, the family, the planning circle, but also the political clients of the, of the late president and the former ruling party that at the contrary saw um, no opportunity for change, but struggled as they could you know, to keep the system going. So this is why before announcing the president's death, there have been tough negotiations within the clan uh, to establish a kind of continuity. And actually what we see uh, when comparing the two approach uh, is that uh, the majority of the people that have been hoping for a change uh, are mainly the youth and they have been on the street demonstrating and trying you know, uh, to struggle for a real change to happen. Uh, but the demonstration have been uh, very toughly repressed uh, with more, actually more than 10 people uh, who died during the, the demonstrations. And so we see that although the president passed away, uh, the system is still here. And this is due to many, fa uh, many factors. Uh, the first, uh, I would say, is the silence uh, of the international community. And uh, ironically, we have been comparing you know, how the international community here, the uh, African Union mainly, uh, but also regional organizations like uh, the Central African States Organization, but uh, also uh, the biggest partner of Chad uh, to win France, they have been very uh, loose, allusive on what was going on in Chad. And we see that they have been in some way supporting uh, the transitional or the un unconstitutional uh, take over uh, at the head of the country. Uh, compared to Mali, uh, to what happened in Mali some, uh, some months ago, we have been here very shocked by this very um, loose uh, position of all those institutions. And ironically, we saw yesterday that some, something very close to what happened here happened again in Mali. And we saw that even there, uh, the condemnations have been very uh, fast and even tough than what uh, happened here in the country. So uh, to not to, to, to take more time, uh, I would say that um, what happened in Chad have offered an opportunity for a change, but we could see clearly uh, that uh, both at the international, but also at the local, um, local level, we saw that all is in the country in place uh, for a continuity to mean an undemocratic um, system dom dominated by uh, military and uh, no uh, other uh, possibility for takeover at the head of the, uh, the state than uh, going to the, to, to the arms. Uh, so actually, I think that what really appear here is kind of disappointment, uh, mainly from the EU and the civil society and opposition parties, uh, you know, about this uh, lost, of, uh, lost uh, opportunity and mainly against the African Union and the France uh, as the supporters of uh, what is happening. Over to you, John. Yeah, thank you, Ramanji. Yeah, I can imagine it's it's been difficult both being uh, feeling like the international groups that you wanted to come see and bring change didn't do that, uh, but also the practical difficulties of this uh, uh, sort of unexpected turn of events has, has probably caused a lot of disruption not only in research, but also in the people going about their daily lives, their development, their education, their economic um, activities. Uh, I know for Florian, this has been a bit of a disruption as well as you were planning to be in Chad now actually and had to cancel those plans. Uh, we'll transition away from sort of talking about the politics, which maybe uh, I'll be out of my depth into talking more about the linguistics. I wanna ask you Florian a bit about how you got involved uh, in your research with LOL. I think maybe for people who haven't done this kind of field work, um, it's hard to grasp just how uh, long and complex the process can be of building the relationships, the networks, the uh, formal permissions you need, the institutional support you need to be able to uh, go and do this kind of research. So LOL is obviously intriguing uh, as a language from sort of a linguistics point of view, as an isolate, as a group, you know, language spoken by a small group of people, but how practically 
did you go from being a European uh, graduate student to getting into this village in Chad and working with this group in a way that was, you know, uh, safe and ethical and uh, allowed you to do the kind of research that's shown in this film? Um, uh, thanks for the question and thanks for organizing this uh, discussion. Um, so the project started in 2000, the project officially started in 2011. So exactly 10 years ago in May of 2011, but I went to the field before applying for funding. This was funded by the uh, DOBES program of the Volkswagen Foundation. So documentation of endangered languages, a program that the Volkswagen Foundation had until 2012, I think we were one of the last uh, projects funded. Uh, and before I applied, I needed of course to, uh, write the application to have a lot of very precise um, information in there to show that I knew what I was talking about. But mostly I needed to make sure that I contacted people uh, belonging to the Lao speaking community to make sure that they were interested in the project and uh, to see what was possible. And so I went to Chad one year before uh, the project was accepted, a few months before the application deadline, and I visited the villages. Um, I didn't know how to get to the villages. I didn't know how to get in contact with people. So I decided to go to the closest town, which is Saar in southern Chad, 150 kilometers south of the villages, hoping that there would be at least um, pupils in schools, students in schools that I could maybe contact to get in touch with um, um, Lao speakers or people from the region, from the villages. Um, so I went to one of the main um, high schools in uh, Chad, which happens to be the high school that mm -hmm. Emma, our colleague here, went to. And asked the director, do you know of anyone from those villages, from the area? He told me I didn't even know they existed, so I'll try to send somebody uh, around the classrooms to ask around, but I'm not too hopeful. <laughs> so he did, and uh, two days after that we met again, and he told me I did not, we did not find anyone, any students in the um, school that knew of that area, but the... Oh physical education teacher has a colleague in another high school that is from that village. And by the way, here he is, you can meet him right now. I've invited him. And so I met with that person who indeed turned out to be the heir of the chieftainship of the village. And so I discussed my, pro my project with him and said, well, here I am, this is what I wanna do, I'll document the language. I'm interested in such and such questions because such and such reasons. Uh, what do you think? Well, how should I proceed? Can I meet people? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I was lucky enough to that the first person I met um, understood what my plan was because he'd been to school. He had uh, a relatively high level of formal education, spoke French so we could communicate very easily. And so he said, yeah, we're interested. Uh, that's very good news for us. Um, here's my brother. He will take you to the villages whenever you want. Uh, and so two days after that, I was in the village with his brother, who turned out to be the chief of the village. And um, through him, I managed to meet uh, the villagers to explain what I wanted to do, what the project would consist in, that it would be linguistics and history and anthropology and music, because I had this idea already that I wanted it to be a multi-disciplinary uh, um, documentation project. Um, and uh, the I, of course, spoke no Lal or no other language of the region at the time, so I had to speak French, and the chief who spoke French translated into Lal to the villagers, and basically everybody seemed to be happy with the idea that there could be an international team of researchers coming to the village and working with them on their language. Um, the first time I arrived, the rebellion that Remaji mentioned um, a few minutes ago was still going on. The uh, um, chief of this rebellious movement had been arrested a few months before I got to Chad, but the region had been um, turned upside down by military operations. And people from the right bank of the river, and Gori is on the right bank of the river, had been basically chased away from their villages and had been relocated or had relocated themselves in um, refugee camps on the other side of the river. So when I got to the village, I was not in the village, but in the refugee camp. And I thought, I'm coming here in a situation of distress, proposing to write a grammar and a dictionary. This is not going to work. This is not something that people are going to be interested in or even willing to listen to because they have so much more on their plate right now. And um, people were actually very interested and very happy that for once someone was coming to their villages to know them basically and to spend time with them and to 
uh, be interested in them. So I had no difficulty in basically getting the community to say, yes, we're very interested in getting the representative of the, of the community in the two Lao speaking villages and in the town of Sartre to sign um, a paper that I wrote in French that I had uh, translated orally into Lal in the two villages that basically uh, said, we are interested in this project, which is the, the uh, consent form that I um, added to my grant application to show that I had been in touch with the community. So this is how I approached the community the first time, uh, basically trying to find my way to the villages one way or another, and it ended up working quite well, I was relatively happy with the people that I met first because it made it very easy for me to basically get to the villages. And um, some people at first were surprised by seeing a foreigner, a white person coming to their villages and pretending that they they were interested in learning the language, which no one else in the country is interested in even knowing about. Um, but this suspicion didn't last long when they realized that um, what I was doing was actually indeed learning the language and speaking it with them and sitting down with them to just learn the language. Uh, some people must have found me strange for a little while, but they were like, oh, he's weird, but that's fine. He's harmless. Uh, so that's basically how it, the, the first um, uh, encounter um, went. And then I came back. So I uh, came back to France and I applied for this grant. I um, looked for colleagues to be the anthropologist and the ethnomusicologist of the team. That's um, how I found um, Sandrine, how I found the first anthropologist who worked for the project for a year and then uh, had to go and was replaced a year after that by uh, Remaji. So that's how the team was um, um, assembled. And, um, and then we've been going back to Chad uh, nearly every year since 2010. Um, and so the, the relationship with the villagers was built over time. Um, we were very fortunate to always have a positive welcome. That is, there were never any problems with anyone in the village or in the community living in town. Uh, and uh, it was very interesting to see how we got to know each other um, over time, how we got to know a few people better than others because they turned out to be more interested or they were our neighbors in the village, uh, how relationships developed over time. Um, some of those relationships you can see in the movie already. Um, but of course, the movie was shot in 2012, so nine years ago. Uh, and we've been going back every year ever since. So many of these relationships have gone deeper since then. Uh, really illustrates, I think, a relatively high level of sort of initial investment before the project even begins and some risk because you actually don't know if any of these things are going to work. But in your case, it seems like there's been a long term payoff, both in terms yeah. of the research you've been able to do, but also the, the relationships you've been able to build and the mutual sort of enrichment get out of, out of that approach to, to looking at languages. Yeah. So Sandrine uh, Florian mentioned that he was looking for an anthropologist when you first heard about this project. What was your reaction? I mean, you're 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 not really a linguist by training, you're, but you do ethnomusicology. You're interested in filmmaking. How? Why did you accept to get involved in this project, and uh, why did you want to bring the idea of making a documentary into this project? <laughs> well, um, yes, I I accepted the project. Thank you, thank you, Joy, for um, inviting us first of all, and uh, for. Uh, and uh, giving us the, the possibility to, to show the film uh, to, to a lot of uh, linguists. Um, yes, uh, first of all, of course, I, I accepted immediately uh, to, to participate to this project because it was uh, very interesting for me. It was a, a, region, a region I didn't know yet, the Chad. Uh, uh, in my previous researches, uh, I had worked uh, in Niger and Burkina Faso, especially always in the Sahelian uh, northern reg region of these countries. So we were uh, near the forest, and uh, it was uh, the first time for me also to, to participate to a um, multidisciplinary program. I was used to, to work alone. And um, and to do my research uh, in my, on my side, and uh, it was um, very exciting for me to uh, to work with um, other specialty and uh, other researchers uh, on the, on the same project. So I, I oh, <laughs> immediately accepted the the proposition of, of Florian, of course, and um, after that. that 
I also um, very quickly decided to, that I, I wanted to uh, to make a film during this research program, um, but I separated the uh, the work. Uh, at first, I worked only on the documentation of the of the music, which was my real mission on the on this project, and um, it's only uh, uh, during the third. Uh, field work that I decided I decided to devote myself entire entirely to the film, um, and with a, we worked with a female cameraman uh, called Charlotte Krebs, who joined us uh, for about six uh, no five weeks uh, just for the shooting, um, and me yeah, at the direction and also the the, the shooting sometimes, or also the the sound. Uh, I, I made uh, yes the sound um, in the making a film uh, in these conditions uh, takes a lot of energy. Um, we we had no electricity, no permanent house, so I knew that I couldn't do my research in the direction of the film uh, at the same time. I needed to to be totally immersed um, in the day to day process of of making the film. So. I devoted entirely about five weeks to, to the shooting. And uh, regarding this process, um, at the very beginning, I had rather imagined making a film about music since it is my specialty. Uh, but very quickly, I realized that um, what was the most interesting in the, in the village was its small scale multilingualism. Be, um, because, um, Okay, for me it was really fascinating to 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 observe this uh, as a uh, non-linguist person uh, because uh, in the previous uh, uh, regions of, of uh, Sahelian uh, Africa where I used to go, um, the. Um, uh, these regions are, are dominated by much larger languages and uh, multilingualism is also present there, but uh, rarely beyond three or four languages. Uh, uh, so this situation was uh, really new for me and um, it made me realize suddenly that this this must have been the situation of all humanity before the emergence of uh, centralized forms of power. And um, we've forgotten that we are inherently multilingual, multilingual, sorry. Uh, and it, it is what this small Chadian village uh, reminded me. And uh, I think, I hope reminds us. So at the orgi origin of the project, uh, there is also the, um this simple question uh, which is uh, well which I, I was asked several times uh before my departure to chat uh young people that i met uh, told me and sometimes also my students um asked me oh documenting a language spoken by 700 people what is the point why <laughs> why do why to do that and why learn such a small language so um, I realized that um, the loss of biodiversity in the world uh, is currently as uh, the center of many debates, but the general public is finally very little aware uh, of the issues of loss of cultural diversity that affects especially small um, so-called indigenous uh, societies. Um, and yet, um, the two uh, uh, are, um, of course, closely linked, uh, since uh, these small minority societies, uh, which uh, yet represent 5% of the world population, uh, speak about 5,000 uh, of the world's uh, uh, 6,500 uh, languages. And they are also the guardians of 80% uh, of the world's biodiversity. So um, it, is, it was important for me to make a film that addresses uh, the general public on these issues. Um, and also um, it was important um, uh, to develop these issues with a different point, point of view um, of, uh, from what has already 
been done on the subject. Um, that is to say, um, not to emphasize the spectacular dimension uh, of uh, such project. Um, it's not, we, we didn't study a language uh, uh, that have only, only a few speakers left, or uh, it is not uh, a film uh, which uh, focuses only on the linguist uh, at the new adventure of the uh, 21st century. Uh, so it was important for me not to, to emphasize this, uh, this aspect, spectacular aspect, and uh, to show uh, the real work, the real relationship with, um, with the people of the villages, uh, of the village, and, um, and, um, and also, of course, what is at stake uh, when uh, we document uh, a small language. Mm, that's great. Thank you, Sandrine. <laughs> uh, so, Ramaji, you came into this project a bit later than uh, the others to fill in for an anthropologist. Um, I wonder if you could uh, say a bit about what your role in the project was, but I'm also curious, because uh, I know your background is in anthropology, but more focused on economics and politics and not really on languages or rural lifestyles. Um, so could you say a bit about uh, how this project impacted you as the anthropologist? Uh, as well as how you Could impacted you say a bit the about project. About, uh, how this project impacted you as an anthropologist, uh, as well as how you impacted the project. Okay. Um, I think we're going to answer the question. I'm sorry, I, I forgot my video. I might be able to have a connection. Or the connection is very poor. So, okay. I, it's quite okay. broken up, but I can hear you a bit. So let, let's try to hear your response and see how it goes. Okay, so I'll try and you let me know if uh, you're not helping me. Okay, so I mean, when I when I heard about this project, you know, I was sitting in, um, in Halle in Germany uh, doing my PhD. So I received the, the, the TORs uh, and um, when, I read, uh, when I read them, I was very happy because I mean, the project was taking me back home. And I mean, back home, not just to chat, but especially in my, 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 my home, my hometown. And uh, what was surprising for me was that I didn't, I never heard about this language, this land, uh, language. And so I was excited, really excited uh, to, join, to join the project first. Uh, yeah, I mean, to, 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 to know this about, you know, what is this language and what are those people that actually are just, you know, some 700 speaking this language. Uh, this was one. Uh, and the second uh, is also uh, the, the methodology that was proposed for the project. As an anthropologist, I didn't get any opportunity, you know, to go for this kind of field works that would take you in those new places out of the, the, the urban uh, sites and that would bring you in a society where you could live, you know, uh, get more time, come to know people, uh, come to know how they live, etc. Because for my PhD, I've been working on oil, and meaning this is something that has more to do with cities and uh, with uh, uh, economic ecology. But so this was an opportunity for me, really getting back to what I call traditional anthropology, uh, getting to know a society and to describe a society. So I was really uh, excited, you know, uh, going there. And when I reached uh, Sa, the, the, the team was already on the field. And then when I meet the first uh, representat representative of the, the Lal people, uh, I come to see that they, they were people that I grown up with without knowing that they are from this very, uh, very group that we will be working about. So I was kind of, you know, uh, a very surprised and, this makes the, uh, the excitement more, uh, more higher uh, than from the beginning. And then uh, I really appreciate the field. For me, it was about my job. Uh, doing my job means learning a new language, uh, but it also uh, means learning uh, new things and people that I, uh, I, I have thought I know, but that I really didn't know. And what made things easier for me was uh, the, the, 
the, the, the language aspect of the thing is that the people there could speak even my native language while I was to start learning their own language. So I could, from the first day, start my work uh, without waiting, without sometimes needing any translation. Uh, and the last thing is how we manage to connect I mean, within the team. An anthropologist, uh, I try to do my work in a way that I could always uh, help Florian um, go further in learning the language, uh, working on the dictionary, uh, discovering new words, uh, discovering new expressions, and also uh, connecting with Sandrine so for her uh, to work more deeper uh, on uh, other aspects like cultural, cultural aspects like musical uh, aspects, uh, etc. So uh, I think uh, from the beginning, uh, what uh, really makes the project special for me, as I said, is the opportunity going home, uh, the excitement, learning something that was very close to me uh, without being really close to me because I didn't know about, uh, but also how uh, the whole team fit together. And uh, as a child and anthropologist, getting the opportunity uh, to accompany this team and getting the opportunity to alter uh, what will be uh, one of the only one uh, monograph on these uh, people. Uh, I mean, this is something, uh, for me, this is a very big achievement. Uh, because Joe, you know, the, you know the place here, but most of the people, they don't know. Uh, anthropology in this country uh, is very new. Actually, we are less than five PhD anthropologists here. And the Department of Anthropology uh, is have been open since less than ten years. So it means that, I mean, it's a it's a big field, uh, and uh, being getting the opportunity, you know, uh, to contribute with a monography. This might be the first monography by a Chadian. Uh, so this is something I'm very excited about. So back to you, Joe. Yeah, thank you. That's very interesting how aspects of the project were very familiar and close to you, but other things were surprising and new. So there was sort of a mix of things that made it easy for you, but also things that made it interesting. And I'm sure your contribution from your Chadian per perspective was invaluable, both on the linguistics and the anthropology and the ecology, and even how uh, this was filmed. Yeah. Uh, I have a, a list of further questions, but I also want to open it up to anybody else who wants to ask a question. So if you do want to ask a question, feel free to either put that in the chat and I can read it out, or uh, you can use the raise hand function and I'll ask you to unmute and turn off your video, turn on your video if you would like to ask the question. While you're thinking or writing your question there, I'll go ahead and ask another one and then uh, see, see what questions come in. Um, I wanted to ask a bit about, since we mentioned already that this film began almost 10 years ago, and sort of a lot has changed over there, especially in terms of uh, linguistic scholarship. I think in, in certain ways, uh, this film was ahead of its time in the focus, say, on small-scale multilingualism. That seems to have become a much larger emphasis, particularly in connection to language documentation and language endangerment. So I think in that way, this film was sort of ahead of its time. In other ways, aspects of the film might seem a bit dated. Uh, in particular, some of the statistics around language endangerment and some of the vocabulary used to talk about language endangerment. Uh, would any of you like to comment on what things maybe you've learned in the process while you're making this films, what things you might change if you were to start over and, and do it again? Um, sure. Um, so yeah, there are, these are two aspects, two of the most important aspects of the movie, the question of multilingualism and the question of language endangerment. Uh, which have to do with the fact that, as Sandrine said earlier, that she was impressed by the small scale multilingual uh, situation in the village and really was interested in it and inspired by it to actually make a movie. So the movie is mainly about multilingualism, but the justification of the project was language endangerment because it was funded by a program that basically gave money to people who were willing to document endangered languages. And I had to prove one way or another, and we could discuss the criteria at length, that the language was endangered in order to get the money and, and do the work. And so uh, since Sandrine wanted to show uh, the team at work, uh, the question of language endangerment came into play and had to be displayed in the movie. Uh, it was, the, the movie was entirely shot in 2012. So it was only released in 2019 because Sandrine was very busy and, and it took a, a long time to finalize the movie. But indeed, at that time, uh, the linguist of the movie, me, uh, I was a, a young graduate student, and what I knew about language endangerment was what you could read in the literature of the time. 
and what you heard everywhere, what, what you still hear pretty much everywhere today, despite the fact that more and more linguists working on these topics are um, updating the conversation regularly. And one of these updates, of course, is um, the number of languages that are threatened. So you still read pretty much everywhere, inc including on the UNESCO website, that 50 to 90% of the world's languages will be extinct by the end of the century. We've been saying that for 20, 30 years now. Turns out that all the languages that should have died by now are still alive, or not all of them, but many of them are still alive. And so it seems that the rate of disappearance, if that is even the right term to use, the rate of basically language loss is much slower than initially thought, which of course is great news, even though the rate is still too fast uh, and it's still a, a pity that we're losing those languages, but instead of losing um, two languages per month, which was about the estimate um, 15, 20 years ago, we think that we're on average losing three to four to perhaps five per year, which is much fewer languages. So that's definitely one thing that we would update. This discourse about um, how languages, how many languages are endangered would definitely be updated. Um, but then the, the, there are other aspects that I guess can come as disappointing points for linguists, in particular linguists working in, in language documentation and on the question of language endangerment, or however you want to call it, language dormancy, all this, uh, the, this research basically on how languages at some point may uh, stop being passed on to the next generation, because it is not the goal is not to, to make a scientific movie. So it's not a, a scholarly article with images. It really was intended to be a movie, uh, and it was intended to uh, uh, touch a broad, as broad as possible, a broad public, and so to sensitize people to the question of language endangerment with the few pieces of information that uh, were um, available and widely available uh, at the time. So there are aspects that um, that are um, not developed in depth in the movie, but there was no room for that in a 56 minute movie. Um, but we still hope that the movie is a good point of departure for discussions on those um, questions. On the question of the link between language and culture, for example, which is an extremely complex one, which of course is very, very, it's not fully covered in the movie, but at least a reflection on what you lose, culturally speaking, or don't lose when you lose a language, um, uh, these sorts of questions. For, um, Another aspect that is present in the movie, but we don't discuss is the political aspect, I guess, which has become, um, which is now at the forefront of discussion about language endangerment, which perhaps was not the case 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. Um, the idea that uh, languages are not endangered because of um, invisible forces, but that there are political forces at work that create situation in which it is difficult to transmit languages or to practice one's languages or to transmit uh, one's language or languages to the next generation. Um, we don't discuss this overtly in the movie, but you can see um, aspects of what's uh, driving potential language endangerment in Chad and in other countries such as Chad. You can see that in the fact that school is entirely in French, which is the colonial language and is the uh, one of the two official languages and the main language of education in Chad, formal education. And you can see in the village that the children just repeat words in French that the that the the teacher shows them without understanding a word of what they're saying. Um, you also um, see that people in town speak French, and the interviews are in French in town, but they don't. They're not in French in the village because in the village, virtually no one speaks French. Uh, you see uh, someone at the end of the movie say, uh, "I want my children to abandon the traditional culture. I want them to be good Muslims because without Islam, there's no future." which is also, of course, something we don't elaborate on, but this is definitely a political force at work, a socio-political force at work in cultural slash linguistic uh, change, potential cultural slash uh, linguistic changes. Um, so these aspects are, are basically present uh, as points of departure for discussion on these topics. Um, regarding, this is a very last word before I let people ask questions, uh, regarding the question of multilingualism, it is true, and we didn't realize that when uh, something was working on the movie, because that literature did not exist really at the time. People were already researching and having ideas about this, but publications had not yet um, had the impact that they've had now about small-scale multilingualism. Um, of course, I read Friedrich Lübke's work on small-scale multilingualism in the context, in the one of the possible African contexts, uh, that of Casamas in this case, 
uh, also Jeff Goods and Pier Paolo Di Carlo's work on the lower fungum in Cameroon. And I gave a talk recently about um, small scale multilingualism, taking examples from Gori and the Lao language and what the situation is in that particular part of Chad. And everything, every, and I, in that talk, I summarized the literature and what has been said about the socioeconomic conditions that allow for small scale multilingualism to exist, uh, to continue to be perpetuated, and that allows for small languages to uh, be um, um, passed on to the next generations and villages. Um, and I realized that I had in the movie, in Sandrine's movie, uh, a clip illustrating every one of these criteria. You have the, the, the way children are raised, not raised just by their parents, but by the entire village to go a little fast on the details, which exposes them to all the languages spoken in the village from a very young age. That's illustrated in the movie, the attachment of people with to all the languages that they speak, their linguistic repertoire, this woman who likes the six languages that she speaks and only death can make you abandon the languages that you speak and she wouldn't be able to choose one that she prefers over the other ones, which is also one characteristic of small scale multilingual societies where people are value multilingualism and like the, the, the are proud of their linguistic repertoires and so on and so forth. So to a large extent, yeah, these um, studies and theoretical notions about small scale uh, multilingualism happen to be illustrated in the movie just because that's what Sandrine focused on when she shot the movie and, and when she actually chose the images to show in the, in the movie. And also ma marriage relationships. Mm. Um, which leads the women to uh, to leave their village and to go uh, in other villages. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so lots of lots of points of departure. There are things that I guess anybody who sees their uh, their academic topic being treated in a popular film will have uh, some kind of uh, criticism or want want it to be further Inevitable. developed. Um, but maybe you could say something about uh, how non-academics have reacted to the film and then have you shown the film to Chadians and how Chadians reacted to the film have you got the kind of conversations that you were hoping to get from the Chadians and how Chadians reacted to the film have you got the kind of conversations that you were hoping to get yes I, I can jump in Florian could you, could you hear me Joe okay I mean yes um we we got the Opportunity to show the film. So I, I yeah I can jump in. I think that we'll see the details when when uh, um, Remaji writes his response. I think what Remaji wanted to say is that the, the response that Chadian viewers gave was different from the responses that we got from Western um, audiences, uh, which is a very interesting point indeed. Um, so Remaji is talking about the reaction from people in Jamena. We showed the, we showed the movie in Jamena. Um, but I also went to the villages which last year. The capital week. city of Chad, maybe we should. Which is, oh yeah, the capital city of Chad. We showed this in the, at the basically the French cultural center and we invited uh, uh, everyone that wanted to come, which included um, people from the university, uh, expats, uh, students, community members, Lao speakers. And um, I unfortunately couldn't be there because it was COVID times and I had left the country with the last flight back to France the day before. Uh, oh, here's his answer. Uh, do you want me to read it aloud maybe? Sorry, that's another question coming in. Well, go ahead and oh, go ahead with your answer and then I'll, I'll read his yeah. next and then we'll go to the next question. Um, but uh, so this is one type of reaction, people, Chadian people who are not members of the community. But I also went to the villages last year in February and showed the movie to the villagers in Gori, in Damtar, which is the other village, uh, but also in Sar, in town to the um, community, to the last speaking community in town and in the villages. And of course the reactions we got were very different. One of the problems uh, showing this movie in the village is that most of the discussion that takes place in, the, in, in my interview and in the, um, what Sandrine says in the movie about the multilingual situation about language endangerment is in French. And so people in the village in their vast majority don't really understand French and can't really participate in that. So that's a part of the movie they're not getting. But a lot of that is also illustrated in the interviews in Lao of villagers. So the relationship of villagers with their languages, the questions about multilingualism, questions about language endangerment, questions, questions about um, moving to town, why would you want to move to town and so on and so forth. These things take place in Lao in the movie. 
And so there's a, a lot of the movie that is still very much um, available for discussion and thinking. But the reactions that we got were mostly reactions about seeing themselves in the movie, seeing people they know in the movie, uh, thinking back about what uh, took place in the village about nearly 10 years ago. A lot of reactions about a lot of the old people that we see in the movie um, died since uh, 2012. Um, most of the, the old people we see in the movie are not with us anymore. And so that, of course, was also um, part of the reactions that we got, like people um, being reminded of the existence of those people. And um, that was an important part of the reactions. Um, so the, the, rea the reactions we got from the villagers were not so much about multilingualism, about those, that sort of issues, but more about um, the way they appeared in the movie. Uh, reactions we got from people in Damtar, the other village, we don't really see images from that other village because we never had the time to shoot images in the other village. So of course, the, rea the first reaction we got is, why are, we, why are we not in the movie? Which the villagers said half jokingly, of course, um, because they knew why they weren't there. But, uh, but of course, that's something they had to say. Um, but uh, overall, there was a lot of laughter during the, 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 sh the um, screening of the movies in the two villages, including in town, people were extremely happy to see the movie, to see the result of this work. Uh, they were extremely happy to see their village on a screen uh, in a professional movie. Uh, and yeah, laughter was, was uh, the most uh, common reaction to mostly every scene. And interestingly, people didn't laugh at the same junctures or at the same moments as um, other audiences outside of the villages, because of course they laughed at things that would make only a villager laugh because they know the context, they know the people and so on and so forth. So that was another interesting aspect of uh, the reactions we got from the, the, the villagers, but everyone asked to have a copy of the movie, um, which we're still working on because the movie is too heavy to fit on um, memory cards that go into cell phones, but we're going to, um, the next time I go back to chat, I'll go back with uh, memory cards and a uh, low definition version of the movie so everybody can have it and show it to everyone they want. And clearly it was obvious that they were very happy about it and very proud of uh, being the object of such a movie. So that made me very happy to see that. That's great. And Sandrine, did you want to add anything, any reactions uh, you've had to the film? No, it's okay. Uh, oh, yeah. said everything. <laughs> I agree <laughs> completely. Good. Well, we got a question from our participant. Uh, Patricia is asking uh, if you can give a brief update on the documentation uh, process. What are the existing or future plans for the project or what happened since you, know, you stopped filming uh, for this movie? Uh, the stuff you did there. And then I know you started a new project with Remiji as well. Maybe you want to talk a bit about that, but what's been going on in, in terms of the, the language documentation and research since this was filmed? So we, the project is officially over in the sense that the funding period has ended and there aren't any funds uh, anymore for the project. So it's lasted officially from 2011 to the end of 2019. We managed to stretch the funding over um, seven years. Um, eight years, eight years actually, uh, but it had started a year before and I'm going back to Chad and every time I go back to Chad, I go back to the villages for a few days now only, but I keep uh, having things to check with the people. I, I keep having a few things to, um, to do there. So uh, the, the documentation is ongoing, I would say, although now I document a lot less uh, because I have a lot less work, um, a lot less time actually to spend in the villages. We collected, um, I don't remember how many hours of um, recordings, um, over a hundred and something hours of texts, uh, about 15% of which are fully transcribed and translated and glossed and grammatically analyzed. Uh, maybe 30% are somewhat uh, annotated. There's at least a vague translation or a transcription or an attempt at transcribing. Um, we collected hours of recordings of music. Sandrine uh, collected a lot of music and dance. So we have a lot of hours of music and dance, including of musical practices and dances from other groups in the region, because this is a highly multilingual area. And it's also an area where there are nomadic uh, Fulbe uh, and nomadic Arabs uh, in like near the village who keep passing through the village. And so we were often invited to weddings and ceremonies in other communities where uh, Sandrine also shot images of people dancing, dances that had nothing to do with what we were doing in the village. So we have a collection of recordings from the region. Uh, we have a, a, 
I don't even know how many thousands of pictures that are not yet archived because it's so many pictures that I really would like to give uh, um, titles to so that they're not just pictures, but pictures with the documentation. So this is an ongoing process of archiving all the pictures, but we have a, a huge archive that is now entirely online and entirely open access. So that's part of the Dobes archive, which is online, um, um, curated by the Max Planck Institute of Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And all of our recordings, I would say that 95% of what we recorded is online. We still have about 5% to go through and up, uh, upload. And it's all freely available, um, freely downloadable with the um, um, consent of the speakers and the community, of course. Um, I did get a new uh, grant, new funding to basically do the same thing in another language of Southern Chad spoken a hundred and something kilometers further east. And so that's what my efforts and the Remaji's efforts are um, focused on now. Um, but every time I am in Chad, I always find a week to go back to Gori and Damtar, visit the people and spend time with them because, I mean, many of them have become, become friends and, and, and people I cannot go to Chad without visiting. Um, so it's likely that I will continue working on the language, that I will continue documenting to a certain extent, that I will continue trying to um, get texts that we recorded transcribed and translated. Uh, everything that we haven't had the time to do uh, to um, annotate, we're going to try, I'm going to try and basically bring a little work every time that I go to chat, find a few people who are willing to work with me and continue transcribing and translating. Okay, thanks, Lauren. We have another question from our participant. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yes, hello. I'm sorry I was very late now because I have been at another meeting. There are so many Zoom meetings. But I have a question. I absolutely loved your video. So I have seen it twice. It's fantastic. And I'm working with multilingualism and language acquisition. So that's not really maybe your, your top interest, but it is one of your interests, I'm sure. And I would like to quote some things about how they talk about how easily the children go in and out from between languages and how early they learn them. And do you have any publications I can quote? Um, not yet, but I would like to um, publish a summary of the multilingual situation in the village and in the region um, with the most up-to-date um, um, descriptive tools uh, that people have developed, in particular Friedrich Lübske's framework of small-scale multilingualism, and try to see what this brings to the understanding of the local situation and what the local situation has to tell us about how we might want to change or adapt a few aspects of this theory. Uh, but so there will be something at some point. Um, I suppose you could cite the movie. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's that's the only thing that is out there right now that you can cite. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will do that. Thank you, you very want, much. If you want original Lal texts, so not just the French translation and the subtitles or the English translation and the subtitles, you can just contact me and I'll give you the, the Lal text printed and, and transcribed and, and glossed if you want. Wow, yeah. I will send you an email. Okay, thank perfect. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, one more question, and this may be our last question as we're running out of time. Andrea asked about multilingualism in the village and how prevalent Chadian Arabic is. You don't really hear it in the film, and I guess it's not as common in the in the south of Chad as other places, but it is the, the lingua franca for most of Chad, uh, but it doesn't seem to really be featured in the film. Um, I would say that it was probably not spoken by a lot of people 30 years ago that it was probably not spoken by women 30 years ago or by many women. Um, today, I think that all men in the village speak Chadian Arabic. To what extent, I don't know, maybe not full bilingualism, but uh, a communica communication level, um, Chadian Arabic. And most women probably have some competence in Chadian Arabic as well. Uh, most, all the people who leave the village and travel, um, all the people who live in town definitely speak Chadian Arabic. Uh, all the people who've been to town and come back to the village and spend the rest of their lives in the village, of course, speak Chad in Arabic too. It is not a language that people use among themselves. It's very rare to see that, except for some people who have spent most of their lives in town and are more comfortable in Chad in Arabic than in Lal, in which case sometimes some conversations will be in Chad in Arabic, but that's very, very rare. It's so rare that I basically did not have to learn Chad in Arabic to do my work because um, 
I learned Lao faster than I learned Chad in Arabic because Lao was more important for me to learn. And so as soon as I was fluent enough in Lao, in my own broken version of Lao, um, that was enough to communicate with the people and I did not need to learn Chad in Arabic, which means that now that I'm doing field work in another village where the language situation is different, I have to relearn entirely a new language and I can't use Chad in Arabic, which is a pity because that would be, um, that would be um, uh, a good thing to, to be able to do. But yeah, so Chad in Arabic is becoming more and more prevalent, but not to the point of being a threat to local languages, for example. It is definitely a fifth or sixth language. Um, children respond to orders given to them in Chad in Arabic, but I've never heard a, chi a child speak in Chad in Arabic. And so my guess is that children just know a few expressions and words, uh, but not more than that. Yeah, that's great. Well, I think uh, we've gone up to an hour now, so we'll probably end it uh, there. I didn't see any more uh, questions from our participants. So let me end just by saying thank you to Florian, Sandrine, and Rebanji for being available here today, but also for um, doing your work in such a way that you've been able to share this film with all of us who see that not only you know, is this film really for people interested in language documentation, but because of your focus on uh, multilingualism, it seems to have attracted the interest of a much broader audience and hopefully will continue to uh, spur the kinds of conversations that you were hoping to encourage uh, when you were conceiving of the film and, and making it over this long process over all these years. So thanks for joining us and for sharing this film with us. Um, Joy, just uh, perhaps to, to add the uh, last thing, um, yes, Yes, it's interesting for uh, to know that the, the film is now distributed by uh, an American uh, distributor uh, called Icarus. Icarus. So you can find it um, uh, on the website uh, of Icarus uh, if um, the university or uh, <laughs> other university needs it. Okay. Great. All right. Well, that's great. Thank you, everyone. And, and thank and, you very much for organizing this. That was great. Thank you very much to everyone who participated. That was very nice. It's always nice to have conversations about these topics. And thank you to all, all of you. And um, it's a pity that we couldn't hear uh, Remaji a lot. Because, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry about that connection problem. Okay, I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. Thanks, everyone.